And at the top of the hour, it's 11 o'clock. Welcome to Horde's Dairyman live stream. I'm Corey Geiger, managing editor, and this is our fourth episode here. And we're excited to bring to you co-ops, customers, and COVID-19 here on May 6th, this Wednesday. Today's episode is brought to you, brought to us together here by the generous support of Protecta, and we really appreciate our sponsors today for our live dairy live stream. We always start out each episode with some shout outs to what people are doing in the countryside during these difficult times. I think the dairy industry and farmers have really stepped up and a few of those shout outs and some of these compassionate stories are, are such as this. Uh, Denver's ABC affiliate shared that Dairy Farmers of America, Colorado Dairy Farm Families and Metal Gold Dairy coordinated the processing of over 30,000 gallons of milk for delivery to the Denver, Boulder, and Greeley area food shelters this past week. Meanwhile, in Liverpool, New York, Cargill colleagues Brad Saunders and Ann Bartham led efforts to donate 30,000, excuse me, 3,000 gallons of milk from Dykeman Farms and Mohawk Dairy Co-op to the Food Bank in Central New York and the Regional Food Bank of Northeastern New York in late April. These stories are the backdrop for today's special guests of our dairy live stream program. It's a real treat to have two hardworking CEOs who get up every morning with the mindset of doing all they can to help their dairy farm owners. And these two men grew up on dairy farms. They've lived the dairy industry. Let's start by inviting Jay Bryant to our dairy live stream conversation. Jay is CEO of the Maryland Virginia Milk Producers Co-op Association, the nation's 13th largest dairy cooperative based on our annual Hordes Dairyman Co-op Top 50 list that we publish in each October commission. Brian was tapped to be the organization's CEO in 2002. Jay, as we prepared for this week's episode, you shared with me that your primary focus is keeping every Maryland, Virginia dairy plant online. Plants are running wide open, 24 hours, seven days a week. Jay, welcome to the program. Tell us more what's happening in Reston, Virginia and throughout your co-op area. Thank you, Corey, and I really appreciate the uh, the opportunity to, uh, to visit with the group today. Uh, I think these are, uh, um, as, I, as I have shared with folks, uh, these are the types of opportunities that we're going to continue to have more of. These are the things that I think we're going to do uh, and have done and, and evolve to over the course of the last few weeks, and, uh, and, I, and I really appreciate the opportunity to participate. Um, really, from our perspective, uh, as, as Corey said, uh, our membership is Pennsylvania, really down through the Carolinas and into Georgia. We're in about 11 states. Um, we have four plants. We have two ingredients plants, uh, butter, powder, cream, condensed. We also have two fluid bottling plants. And kind of how the, uh, uh, the COVID virus, uh, I guess, has evolved is, uh, is very telling on how it's affected our operations. Um, when, the, uh, when, when things basically first hit, if you will, uh, and the, uh, the, the, the nation's uh, uh, people were encouraged to stay in and shelter in and, and, and not be out and, and going to, to school and to, and to their jobs. Um, we really saw a huge run on the, what I'll call traditional retail grocery store chain channels. Uh, we serve Costco, we serve Walmart, we serve Food Lion, we serve Giant. Again, uh, you know, regional grocery store chains here in our area. And we saw as much as a 50% uh, lift and 50% increase for probably, I'm going to say, a little less than two weeks. It took about 10 or 12 days uh, to fill up that pipeline. And so um, our two fluid plants were running uh, at capacity plus, but a lot of the third-party uh, fluid bottling plants here in our region, uh, again, uh, uh, Central Pennsylvania down through the Carolinas, uh, anybody and everyone on the fluid bottling side uh, was uh, was really running uh, as hard as they could basically to kind of fill up that pipeline of people being uh, sheltered in and, and staying at home. It was almost like, uh, you know, for a lot of the uh, folks in dairy, we, we understand when there's a snow, a snow scare sometimes for those of us, Corey, not in the upper Midwest, uh, where that's a little bit of a novel thing. And and people kind of attacked the grocery stores for their milk, bread, and eggs. It was like that, but it lasted almost two weeks. 
Uh, and then again, uh, after that, it, it kind of turned on us. Um, and we started seeing, uh, um, you know, a lot of that pipeline being full. I will say uh, the good side of that is uh, really seen it kind of level out. And it's leveled out at about a 15% uh, lift or increase above what I'll call traditional normal sales were in those uh, in those retail grocery store chain outlets. Uh, but really, after about that 10 or 12 day um, um, filling up the pipeline, uh, a lot of milk started coming back into our ingredients business, coming back into our ingredients plants. Uh, and again, we balance for the region, not just for Maryland, Virginia. Uh, probably two thirds to 75% of the milk we take into our balancing operations is our member milk. And then we also balance for some other regional co-ops and uh, proprietary handlers here in the area. And so uh, we really drained the ingredients plants down for about that 10 day, 12 day period. Uh, but since then, once the pipeline's gotten full, uh, we've, been, uh, we've been running uh, both of our ingredients plants at capacity. Uh, capacity for us is about 4 million pounds a day, uh, somewhere in that, uh, in that neighborhood, five to 600 loads a week. And, uh, and really our biggest issue right now, um, we're not that heavily involved in food service. We are heavily involved in schools. And so, you know, we've seen the, uh, the decline and absence, quite frankly, uh, a lot of schools are still trying to do some feeding programs, but, you know, school volume has been greatly diminished. But we've seen that offset from, again, the traditional retail volume in our fluid business. So our fluid business, our two fluid plants are actually uh, pretty consistent with, uh, with what you uh, would have expected their volume to be for this time of year. Uh, but again, the ingredient side has been running uh, very, very strong. Um, the challenge therein then is that we are building up a lot of inventory. Uh, condensed sales have been very soft, cream sales have been very soft, and so you take the solids into powder, you take the butter fat into, into, uh, into butter, and so we've made a lot of butter and a lot of powder for us, again, on the East Coast. Uh, we've made a lot of butter and a lot of powder the last several weeks and have built up a lot of inventory, and so the challenge then becomes with working capital and being able to, uh, to carry that inventory because the market right now on uh, on, on butter and powder is uh, dramatically reduced uh, from where it has been. And so um, being able to continue to have outlets to move that product is, uh, is few and far between, uh, if you will, but uh, we continue to try to move it as best we can. The industry does. Uh, we're all in that boat, but uh, we're all building up a whole lot of inventory right now. Um, I'll uh, I'll close by saying uh, you know uh, to kind of to kind of turn it over to Keith a little bit. Um, to your point, um, you described us in two different ways. One was uh, long tenured career, and the other one was smart executives. And I'd say you're probably at least half right. Uh, he and I have been around for a good long while, and so uh, there is a fair amount of experience here. Uh, but we have different organizations, but we are working through a lot of the same things. Um, Keith has a, uh, a lot larger member number than we do. Uh, his members are obviously a lot larger. Um, we've got about a little less than a thousand members, but our average member is about 125 cows. And, uh, and so uh, there's some logistical challenges and things that we work through in, uh, in, in that process. But again, um, you know, we're building inventory, uh, we're drying powder, we're making butter. Uh, I'm sure Keith is doing the same thing, and uh, and hopefully as the uh, as the country starts to loosen up a little, and uh, and and start to get back in gear, and our economy start to uh, uh, to get the wheels turning again, uh, hopefully we're going to see an opportunity to uh, to continue to move product, and uh, and hopefully the the uh, the second half of the year things start to look a little better. But uh, it's been a uh, a very interesting, uh, a very tough a very challenging, uh, I guess, seven or eight weeks here uh, for this industry and quite frankly, for this country. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for your candor. We really appreciate it. Before we introduce our next guest, I'm gonna ask our producer, Jim Bolt, to put up a poll question here. We're gonna kind of look at the psyche of the folks that are on this uh, dairy live stream broadcast. Our question is gonna be this, 
how long are you expecting to limit production because of co-op processor or personally instituted milk production uh, regulations or restrictions really I probably should have edited that word to restrictions but uh, the answer options are one to two months three to six months six to twelve months or one year or more it's really what do you how long do you think these markets are going to be impacted due to COVID-19 the polls are coming in really strong here we have 25% of our people that are online right now uh, have voted here. We'll give it a, a little bit more uh, time here for the vote to come in. And uh, it'll be interesting what we see here. And I think Keith and Jay and Mark and Chris will be interested to see this too, what people are thinking in the countryside coast to coast. So we're gonna give that five more seconds here. So get your votes in there uh, on the poll question here. And with that, uh, Jim, let's go ahead and close the polls here. So uh, the, the consensus here is that this could go on for three to six months was our top poll response at 45%. And then next came six to 12 months, 29%, one year or more, 15%. Nobody thinks this is gonna be a short-term deal here at one to two months. So uh, very interesting. We'll share some of that with our readers on Hordes Dairyman Intel here Thursday and Monday as well when Caitlin Allen and Maggie Gillis write those up. We're uh, excited to have Keith Murfield here with United Dairymen of Arizona. He has been with the organization since 1997. Murfield grew up on a dairy farm in South Dakota and now serves as CEO of United Dairymen of Arizona, the nation's 11th largest dairy cooperative. So very similar milk volume here. Uh, it's Maryland, Virginia. Keith, how has your cooperative adapted under these COVID-19 induced market conditions? Well, you know, it, it was the worst time, like I was saying, is to, there's not a good time for what has just happened to this country, but for the co-op, the UDA, it was the worst time because we were right at our peak milk production. We hit peak milk production this year on uh, the week of March 11th, and usually it's about the 1st of April. Uh, what happened to us, what that really means is we say we peak at around 12 and a half, 13 million pounds of milk a day. The plant can run eight and a half million. And inside, we don't have multiple plants like Jay was talking, but we do have a plant with uh, three big dryers in it, plus two other byproduct dryers. And so they were running full already when, when, uh, when this hit. And so what happened is our, our liquid customers, which a lot of our liquid customers are very dependent on food service. They, they obviously, their demand was cut back. So they therefore cut back with us because we are really a balancing co-op. And for about two weeks, we were dumping up to a million pounds of milk a day in digesters. And we dumped a lot of byproducts, which is the first time in my 45, 46 years that I've ever had to dump cream for the co-op. And, and other buttermilk and WPC. So we were, um, we were giving milk away. We were uh, fill, filling up food banks, doing everything possible not to let this milk uh, uh, turn into electricity through the digesters. The class one sales in, in this part of the world are around 22 to 25%. So basically what happened is, yes, we had an uptick for about 10 days. And then uh, even though stores were holding back uh, the limiting buying of milk, but uh, we finally got that taken off, but they went back to normal after about 10 days. So what did the co-op have to do? You can't just sit there and dump milk. Um, and, and so we put it, went back to our, we, first of all, we have a quota over quota system that we kind of control milk production, but we had to went back to our old history program, which was from, March and April of 2018, and and we went to 90%. And, and what that was trying to do was, and it did, it, it stopped the dumping. Um, but of course, some producers had to change the way they did things, whether it was go from three times a day to two times a day milking, some of them changed feed rations, anything they could do to uh, slow up the milk production. They wanted to call a certain amount of cows. I mean, they were calling cows that were averaging over 80 pounds of milk a day, and uh, but they were trying to get the numbers down. And like Jay talked about, you know, we've, we've had powder 
uh, prices drop about 50 cents a pound. Butters drop 75 cents a pound. So on top of the producers trying to cut milk production, they were also in their co-op. It took a huge write down on inventories uh, for us. And we're, um, you know, we're seeing demand slowly come back from the, our, with our customers that supply the food service. And, and we think with the USDA out there buying the product that was just announced uh, 120 million over the next couple of months, this will help move some product. But the only thing we got to remember, as Jay was mentioning, we have a lot of butter, a lot more inventory of butter, a lot more inventory of powder. Usually we have about a 20 day inventory of powder at any given time. And right now we're sitting at 70 days. So, and we're just, you know, we're just one, uh, one of the plants that uh, uh, make powder in the United States. So we're, we're coping with it. We do, like I said, we only have one major plant. The other locations we have, there's a blending operation and then we have a cheese cut operation in Mexico City where we bring U.S. cheese down there and cut and distribute it for Mexico uh, in the Mexico City area, but um, we're um, we're at least handling all of our milk. Um, the one thing out here, there was no other place to go with our milk, um, and uh, because California, New Mexico, everybody was full, and uh, so so therefore that's why we uh, end up going to uh, to the digesters. But um, that's where we're at right now. Thank you so much, Keith. We're gonna do another poll question here and it's gonna lead right into our next topic. So Jim, if you could put that up there. And the question is this, one answer question, due to COVID-19, how much money could the US dairy industry lose in 2020 milk sales? These answers are all with a B as in billion. 5 billion, 10 billion, 15 billion, or 20 billion. And we've done some rough, rough estimates on this. So go ahead and, answer those poll questions here. Uh, I can see that uh, 5 billion is not getting a lot of love here and that's probably a good choice. That is gonna be on the low side, but outside of that, keep going ahead and answering that. And uh, we got 41% of the people have voted already and it's we're pushing 50% right now. And uh, the answer to this question will be revealed here very shortly by Mark Stevenson. As you continue to answer that question, I'm thankful for uh, Protecta to be sponsor at this program. that have been great uh, partners with Hordes Dairyman. So Jim, we're at the one minute mark. Let's go ahead and close the polls and see what we got here. Uh, and I'm not gonna give the answer quite yet. Mark Stevenson, we've learned a great deal. Why don't we leave that slide up there, Jim, so people can see it at first. But Mark, we've learned a great deal from Jay and Keith and their insight was credible. Given what's happening on our nation's dairy farms, dairy co-ops and dairy processors, a number of US congressional delegations have asked you to put a number on the collective losses for the US dairy industry. That number relates directly to this poll question. Mark, take it away. Thanks, Corey. Um, you know, it's, this is a tough, a tough question to answer in any kind of meaningful way because there's so many moving parts to the dairy industry. But my approach when I was asked to look at this was to go back in time uh, a little bit and take a look at futures markets. Um, futures markets are a pretty good place for us to estimate what we think the value is going to be or the price is going to be over some period of time. We've had um, a lot of evidence uh, in looking at futures markets to know that there is no bias in futures markets. They're always going to be wrong about a price, you know, that many months out. There are a lot of events that haven't occurred yet, but uh, in, including things like pandemics, but uh, nevertheless, um, they are still a good and unbiased source of distilling everything we know about um, the uh, future of milk price evolution. And so that's what I did. Um, can you put up that first slide that I had, Corey? Um, yep. Yeah, this is a good one. This is looking at the May futures price. Okay, so this is um, what folks were thinking that the May price for class three and class four was going to be at different points in time. 
And you'll notice back here in January that uh, we had class four prices actually superseding class three. They were higher. Class three prices were not too far behind, but um, at the very end of December, the first news began to appear about the coronavirus in China. Now, this was not hitting our major news cycles yet at all, but um, China first let it be known that there was a viral problem, uh, at least in some parts of China, on December 31st, I think it was. By the time we get out there oh, around the 20th of January or so, we had the first known case of coronavirus in the US. And that was a person who had come here directly from Wuhan, China, which is the hot spot there. Um, but our markets hadn't picked on, on that very much at that point in time. Although there was some concern about what that might do to exports. And we began to see the prices unravel then over that period of time. As we began to realize that this actually could be a pretty big deal, we started to see South Korea fully involved in, um, in coronavirus. We had um, some cases in the U.S. then at that point in time, but they were pretty minor. Um, Italy was a major surge, and by the time we get toward the end of Mar or February, we had the first death from coronavirus here in the U.S. And a little later on, get toward the middle of March, the U.S. declares this to be a national emergency. Um, the U.S. leads the world in confirmed cases by the time we get toward the end of March. And at that point in time, most states declared a stay-at-home directive. And uh, when we get down here again uh, past the middle of March, we've got a death toll worldwide that is more than 200,000 uh, people from this coronavirus. So that news, all collectively getting negative and worse, I think, as time goes by, has led to uh, impacts in the dairy industry on our milk prices. So my um, approach to doing this was to take a look at what futures prices were thinking about at January 24th, before we started to have known cases here in the U.S. and before this was hitting any of our major news cycles. And at that point in time, we had class three prices maybe um, north of $17, south of $18 uh, for this May month. Uh, but if we could show that next slide, you'll start to see what class three prices look like. The blue line is showing you the full expectation as of January 24th, what the uh, um, futures prices were for class three, basically at $18. We were looking at a at a fairly good milk price year um, at that point in time. You can also see then when that um, well, sort of orange colored line, what the futures markets were thinking about those prices for the uh, rest of uh, 2020 um, or the actual prices over that time period. May is the bottom. May is the place where we we're expecting prices to be the lowest and coming up over that time period but never returning to our optimism uh, that we had at the beginning of the year. So this was my approach. And when you take this amount of price um, loss uh, during this uh, 2020 year, and you multiply it by even last year's milk production, let alone the increases that we've seen already this year, we come up with a number of about $10 billion. Um, so that's taking class three and class four prices and using an estimation of uh, the U.S. all milk price, because I think that's a, a better estimation of prices. Um, and I've subtracted 50 cents from that. The reason I did that is because we've seen not the historic relationships between class three and class four and the all milk price, but we've seen some premium destruction as well that's happened. So. Um, I've taken that into account. This doesn't really try to capture all of those masked sales that we've had at distressed milk prices, which don't even show up yet here. Um, ultimately, they may, but about $10 billion is what it looks like our loss in price is. The other thing I will say is that this does not account for um, milk that we are simply not going to produce and get to marketplace. Those are additional losses 
that you would have to factor into that. Um, so $10 billion is probably conservative. You'll notice that I didn't say $10.213 billion because I don't want to suggest a degree of precision on an estimate like this that simply uh, isn't there. But that's what I think we've been looking at. Thank you, Mark. We're going to turn to Chris Wolf here uh, with Cornell University, but currently in near the East Lansing area. Chris, when we begin to talk about how we will never make dairy farmers whole from this COVID-19, but talk about that 10 billion number would it be, 10 billion would it be, that's substantial. What, we have a few programs that were announced at the federal level, but uh, go through those a little bit and see how they interface. Yeah, thanks, Corey. Yeah, so, you know, the most recent estimate I, I saw for all of agriculture was about a 20% drop in U.S. farm income projected for this year. Um, and Mark's number, I think, is, is uh, bigger than that for dairy. And I think his dairy has been one of the harder hit commodities. On um, April 17th, the Corona Food Assistance Program was announced, and that was a total of $19 billion to be spent, with $16 billion of it in direct payments to farmers. And they announced $2.1 billion for dairy farmers uh, at with $125,000 cap for a commodity and $250,000 per person or entity. And we're still waiting for the details on how that's going to happen. Um, might be hard to spend that $2.1 billion depending on how they come up with the rules. I think Mark can probably tell you more about that. So we'll wait and see what happens there. So that's $2 billion. Uh, they announced $3 billion in, um, in buying dairy. Uh, produce and meat products, and then using that for donations to food banks and other charities. And that, um, you know, some of that purchasing maybe is why we've seen the class three prices do a little better in the last few days, hopefully. Uh, so that could have an effect there. And then, you know, we've got the dairy margin coverage program, Dairy RP, um, about half the herds, maybe a little bit less than half of the licensed herds signed up for the dairy margin coverage program. It's too bad. It wasn't everybody, but the world was a different place in December when you made that sign-up decision. If you look at the payments for dairy RP and dairy margin coverage, and you add them up, it's about a billion for quarter two. It's about 600 million for quarter three, and about two and a quarter million, 225 million, excuse me, for quarter four. So that's about 1.85 billion. So put those two together, and you're at a little bit under four billion. Now, if the market gets better, then the uh, DMC and DRP payments will go down, and if it gets worse, they will go up. But you know that doesn't account for how it's distributed by region or by you know herd size or by the situation that's going on at the co-op, and that matters a whole lot right now. Thank you, Chris. We're going to open it up for questions to our audience members. There's a uh, section here that you may answer a question. You can type that in. We've got some early questions in. Uh, we also have some questions here that we will talk about. Jay, this is a real quick question here for you. Um, Keith alluded or uh, stated that uh, United Dairymen of Arizona uh, reduced milk flow on their dairy farm member owners by 10%. That situation's a little different for you, right? Yes, we, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, yes, Corey, we uh, actually, at this point in time, we have not had to reach out to our members to uh, ask them to decrease production off of the farm. Uh, we have also not, uh, and I knock on wood when I say this, uh, we have also not uh, had the need to dump any milk uh, at the farm level. Um, <clears throat> as we sit today, we actually have dumped uh, some skim loads at our uh, ingredients facility in Laurel, Maryland. Uh, again, uh, we, we chose and had the opportunity to uh, utilize the butter fat in our uh, in making butter, uh, but we basically just uh, to Keith's point uh, when we he and I talk about liquid on the uh, on the ingredient side, we're talking about uh, uh, primarily skim condensed, and uh, a lot of that condensed business uh, uh, went away, if you will, due to the uh, uh, decline in food service, and so we had the ability to uh, to dry a certain amount of milk. And we had a couple of days that we had more skim, basically, than we could feed to the dryer. So we did dump a few loads of skim, uh, not that many. But uh, again, at this point in time, uh, as we sit here in early May, we have not dumped any milk uh, at the farm level. Uh, that's taken a lot of work and effort and energy by our, uh, by our 
uh, by our teams and our staff, uh, and we've not asked our members to uh, to decrease their production. Uh, we're able to take all of the milk into our uh, into our system and uh, and make uh, again and make products out of it. Uh, the issue we have that we're working with again, as I alluded to earlier, was the uh, was the building of inventory and the working capital to be able to carry that inventory. Uh, I'll just say uh, I give our board, I give our members a lot of credit. Uh, we made a uh, strategic decision uh, four or five years ago uh, to invest uh, additional capital into our ingredients and balancing business. Uh, as a matter of fact, I caught. Uh, I caught Murfield when he was over uh, on the East Coast for a national milk meeting, and uh, he's always been one of my go-to guys on the uh, on dryers and the ingredients business. And uh, we actually, uh, I, I conned him into staying over for a day or so, and uh, had him out to our plant and uh, uh, talked about some of the things we were doing. But uh, we increased our capacity at uh, in our in our ability to balance by probably thirty percent. Uh, here over the last couple of years, and uh, uh, I will say that uh, that investment has paid off uh, very dearly uh, here these last few weeks because, uh, again, right now we've not limited our members' production and we've not had to dump anything at the farm level, only, uh, again, a, uh, a few loads of skim. Thank you, Jay. Again, you can uh, type in questions here, and we're getting some in. And uh, we want to thank our partners and sponsors here for today's dairy live stream pro, uh, broadcast, Protecta. Keith and Jay, we on one of our earlier episodes, Mark, Chris, and Andy and I talked about how dairy processing plants are a little different than meat processing plants. And specifically, how have you juggled the new COVID-19 health requirements for your co-op employees in the plants? You want to I'm go ahead, Jim. Okay. Um, well, <clears throat> it's a uh, it's a very interesting question, uh, and when I when I think about our total employee uh, base, um, obviously the majority of our employees are involved in the plant operations and also in the distribution. Uh, we have uh, DSD routes, and we also have uh, tractor trailer loads that go out to again retail, grocery store, warehouses, and so we have transportation. We have plant operations. Uh, we got a lot of moving pieces. Uh, that probably accounts for 85, 80, 85% of the employees in the co-op. And so at the uh, plant and, and again, distribution level, um, I guess a couple of bullet points I would think about sharing are, um, and I wanna give a shout out here. Uh, it just sort of popped into my head. Um, we really fell back on and utilized in the early days uh, the CDC um, recommendations, and also uh, Clay Detlefson at National Milk uh, did a really good job of um, creating some, um, I guess, operational directives and recommendations, and we leaned heavily into that and owned that. Uh, and and we've obviously done, you know, from a uh, cleaning perspective, uh, people that basically had different uh, jobs in our operations and. Uh, <clears throat> maybe in a quote normal time uh, were uh, were put into uh, were put into uh, directly cleaning and and making sure that we uh, kept our operations as uh, as clean as we possibly could. Uh, obviously, the mask and all the different things there that uh, that fall into that category um, from a uh, I guess corporate office perspective and uh, our field staff. Uh, um, most everybody that can, quite frankly, everybody that can that falls into that category has been uh, working from home. A um, couple of times we've had to go out, you know, different ones here and there, and we've done that on a, a very selective basis. But uh, for the most part, our uh, our office uh, folks have worked from home, and uh, and I'll say have done a uh, fantastic job doing that. The last thing I'll point out on the plant side is that. Uh, and I laughed one day, uh, we, we've been having uh, calls every morning, all four of our plant personnel, uh, to talk about the day's activity, to talk about, uh, as y'all know, milk plants do as much at night as they ever think about doing during the day, to kind of talk about what happened last night, what's on tap for today. Uh, then we have a follow-up call every day at 4.30 in the afternoon. And the, uh, the follow-up call a lot of times is more specific to uh, people, any issues that we're having. 
And uh, one of the things we've done is uh, uh, we've not had anyone in our operations test positive. I'll say that. Uh, but if we've had anyone that has been around, exposed to uh, anyone that has, we've sent them home immediately, uh, asked them to basically quarantine at home for 14 days. And then if they don't show any symptoms after that, we allow them to come back. And, uh, and one of the folks at, uh, I'll close with this, Keith, one of the folks at one of our plants said, uh, I said, well, how's that going? And he said, Jay, if I have somebody with a sniffle, I send them home. He said, uh, it's just not worth it. And he said, uh, you know, we've, uh, we have really proactively had people go home and quarantine for 14 days. And uh, again, knock on wood so far, um, so far, we've uh, our, our plant operations folks and all of our employees have just done a great job. Very proud of us. Keith, what's it look like in sunny Arizona? Well, first I'll say that our Mexico City operation uh, considered non-essential, so they they really closed it down in Mexico City, so that we had to suspend operations. As far as what we're doing here, as many people that can work from home are doing that. Uh, if we have meetings here, it's social distancing. We have a big boardroom. We all keep separate. We we zoom in to people that are working from home. Uh, even our board meetings the last two months have been Zoom, so nobody's been in, uh, showed up. Um, plant employees, of course, have to be here, but we ask them, you know, whether in the lunchroom or whether, uh, but it's mostly automated, so we're, the social distancing is not really a problem on that part of it. We're doing the same thing with um, somebody says they don't feel good or they call in, you know, we, we, we got a regular protocol for that. We've had people come in from, uh, that were overseas when this thing hit. So they had to go in quarantine for two weeks before we let them come back in. So we've been lucky in a sense that we've had uh, nobody in the plant, nobody at our, at our dairy locations and or haulers or whatever so um just doing everything we can think of to be possible to uh to keep from having a problem uh, but so far so good thank you we're going to turn this over to mark and chris here and uh, we have a number of repeat viewers here and we talked about exports uh last month here and the, the short question came in how might export impact this expected loss but Larger thing, last week we talked about the potential that food service and the export market were potentially equally responsible for the collapse of dairy product sales. Then the export sales report came out yesterday, May 5th, that March dairy exports topped your earlier sales for the seventh straight month. Is this simply a lagging market indicator or are exports not a big a, a contributor to the collapse of the dairy product sales? And after Mark and Chris weigh in, Keith may want to share what's going on in the export side there. And uh, we have uh, 23 minutes left in our program, so we'll probably to get through more questions, need to pick it up just a little bit. So take it away, Mark and Chris. Well, I'll, I'll go maybe first because I think that I was one that suggested that uh, we ought to keep our eye on exports because uh, we've had some um, known issues there. And one of them was a uh, comment that I made was specifically with Mexico. We've seen the peso devalue quite a bit and that really takes some of their buying power out for U.S. Uh, dairy prices or U.S. prices on any product. Um, on the other hand, it was also coupled and met with relatively low U.S. product prices. So uh, we did see some continued sales, but Mexican uh, sales have been down um, in the reports that we do see, and some of those substantially down. However, Southeast Asian sales more than made up for that, and we saw a lot of product in March that moved there. One thing I think we have to be a little bit cautious of is uh, when those uh, export sales actually get recorded and are being noted, because the sales are being consummated weeks um, in advance before they get recorded as a sale. So some of what we're seeing here, if you think back to that chart when you were looking at the downturn of uh, prices, was back when we weren't as concerned about that, nor was the rest of the world um, yet fully involved. So uh, some of the March sales occurred earlier, but were recorded in March. 
Yeah, no, I think Mark uh, pretty much summarized everything that there is to think about that. I'm wondering how much there is the still potential for this to be kind of a leading indicator. But it was certainly nice that Southeast Asia was so strong. And I'd like to really hear Keith talk about what's going on, what he's seen in Mexico and the trade off between the exchange rate issues and milk prices, product prices, and, and, and just income effects. Well, when it comes to Mexico, obviously we we uh, we produce about 150 million pounds of powder a year, and about 70 percent of it goes to Mexico. Uh, and it's, it's because of location and where Arizona's at for obvious reasons. And then with oil prices dropping like it did, and and it gives them less revenue in dollars. But what we're seeing right now is Mexico is picking back up. Uh, and so we're, that part's going. We are moving a lot of product now to Asia, Southeast Asia again. But I think we're seeing um, we're seeing a lot of different different things happening with Mexico. And I don't think they're going to get back to where they really were for three to six months. But uh, all I can say is things have finally opened up. But again, they've been hurt by the by the devaluation. Um, but I think we're sitting here finally, and because we do a lot of, I'll just go ahead and say it, tariff busters around the world uh, in our blending plant. Uh, but that that is picking up considerably. Our MPC has uh, not missed a beat uh, this whole whole time. And I guess maybe it's a little more of a special type product, but, uh, but we are seeing, uh, medium heats and high heat products uh, picking up demand too. So that's uh, that's currently where we're at. I'm gonna take two questions here that Caitlin and Maggie are working on here and blend them together. And I think this is an all play question here. Uh, the first part will, uh, is the question is, will large inventory stocks and some co-ops and plants, and Jay and Keith, you talked a little bit about that, with large inventory stocks and some co-ops and plants, Will this weigh the market down later? That's the first part of that question. And then is the improvement, this is more of a Mark and Chris question, is the improvement in class three futures after May tied to expected demand recovery or milk supply curtailment? So let's talk about the stocks and then we got uh, what the futures is showing here. A Little bit of, it's all together. It's complex, I know. Go ahead, Keith. Well, when I look at that, if, if we all remember all the powder that was in Europe and uh, EU on intervention, obviously that held the powder prices down. So these inventories will hold class four prices down and, and because of the butter and powder inventories. I do expect class three to be the one that, that will help the dairy producers. Uh, and that, I think that's going to be the leading one. And I think we're going to see a larger spread between class three and class four than what we have normally seen on, on at least on average. Because I feel you know, people, if they haven't had a salad cheese and didn't have to make it, they have not made it. And, uh, but, but what, where it goes is then obviously what we've been talking about, it goes into butter powder. So the answer is I think class four is going to be less, be much less value than class three. Others, I, I would I would agree with that. Uh, we don't have the uh, we don't have what we would describe here as the uh, the government intervention process that the EU does. But nevertheless, uh, Keith did a great job talking about the uh, the seventy days worth of uh, powder inventory as compared to normally twenty or twenty five, uh, and it'll take time to work that down. And until it gets worked down, it'll certainly depress prices. I just throw in there too that um, up here where we make a, a bit of cheese, um, you know, I, I think we haven't seen as much milk dumping happening as farms are struggling trying to reduce milk production a little bit. But we've also had a, a fair amount of milk that's been sold at distressed prices. That's not even showing up, you know, under, um, you know, some of these numbers that we're seeing yet. And that product's being tucked away into cold storage. And we're going to be bumping up against cold storage limits, I presume, in the not too distant future. That too is going to put some pressure on the market. I do expect, like you guys do, that class three is going to be above class four for the year. But 
um, there's going to be some product out here that's keeping a little bit of a lid on recovery as it comes out. Good news is that, you know, we've had plants that are willing to take that bet um, on longer term uh, sales opportunities, even for cheese. But, you know, the bad news is that it takes a while for that product to get moved out and sold too. Keith, or excuse me, Chris, we're going to turn to you here and maybe Mark, uh, we're going to be seeing some DMC or dairy margin coverage payments and a couple of dairy men and dairy women asked, when do you think those payments will start coming out here? What, what's your projection here on when they could see payments on that? Well, we know the final DMC values at the end of the following month. So the April final April values don't come out until we know the final April uh, corn, all milk um, and hay prices, which come out at the end of May. So the, you know, the May payments would then be at the end of June. Um, the dairy RP, Mark, I, help me out there. When do you know what the timing is on those RP payments? I don't recall, I guess, exactly right now. But, you know, we, we will be seeing those uh, kicking in. There were the people that grabbed that, you know, were grabbing it when we were <laughs> the kind of prices that I, I showed in that one graph where we saw $18 is basically a consensus. And that looked like a good place for people to put a floor under. And so a number of folks did that. And as far as the DMC goes, um, the April uh, margin announcement was, what was it, $9.15, I think. So milk is protected at nine fifty. We'll start to see some small payments um, already happening. And uh, next month, uh, we'll have some really big payments at the 950 level. Yeah, you know what? Um, and I guess now that I think about it, the RP is quarterly, right? So yep. um, we're going to have to have the second quarter all three months in there. And then clearly there'll be um, losses there that then you will file the paperwork to collect the payments on. I think uh, this question comes in and let me set the stage. I think there are things that change in society and a lot of things changed at the end of World War II. Rosie the Riveter and Women in the Workplace was one of them. Jane Keith, do you have any projections at all how COVID-19 could change your customer's business in the future? Oh, what a good question. Um, you know, I think that uh, we're learning to do things and have done things. This uh, this this uh, <clears throat> this session being one of them that that historically we've not done. Um, I will say that um, we've seen some of our bottling plants instead of having multiple, I'll call it choices, if you will, for consumers. And I'm sure we'll get back to that because choice is good. Uh, but we've seen things when we really, uh, you know, we're under pressure in the supply chain, we've seen uh, minimal skews. Uh, we've seen a lot of focus on, uh, again, in the fluid side, um, whole milk, uh, 2%. We've just seen some of the lower fat items. Uh, you know, we had retailers telling us, don't worry about that. Just run whole percent, just run whole milk and 2%. And, uh, and, and of course, you know, those kinds of things are going to cause people to look at their numbers and think about that differently. Uh, on the supply chain side, um, we've done things internally here in our operation that um, especially uh, I remember one day uh, we were having a call and one of our plants, uh, we, we, we had a, uh, a logistical opportunity because we could get a lot of milk to one plant. We needed it, oh, you know, two states away, uh, three or four hundred miles away, and uh, we didn't have the transportation. We didn't have the wheels to put under it. And so we're bringing milk in, unloading it, reloading it on transports, getting uh, uh, different types of, uh, of haulers to haul it as opposed to just farm pickup. And we ended up just in the supply chain and working with our customers of communicating daily, multiple times a day instead of a couple of times a week and doing a lot of things that, again, uh, made us quicker and more nimble and able to move lots of milk in large blocks quickly and efficiently that we've not done before. Well, you're not going to go back and like forget about all that stuff. You're going to you're going to think through it. There're going to be some things that you look at the cost versus the benefit. You're going to go, "Well, we're probably not going to do that again because that was pretty costly. It's something we did just to, you know, make it work for a few days." 
but we're going to uncover things and find things. I know we are in our, our operation that we're going to look back and say, you know, we're, the, we're going to do this. We're going to continue to do this. This made a lot of sense. Should have done it before. And, uh, you know, these kinds of pressure situations cause that. They always have. Keith, anything to add in that realm? Well, you know, the only thing I will add, you know, our, our plan, we've, we've been running so full for the last couple of years. Uh, we've been uh, waiting for a, there's a new plant going to be bottling plant going to be opening up um, in the valley uh, this this late fall. So that that was uh, that's going to be a tremendous help to the co-op. But, you know, I think the other thing that we're going to see, there's going to be a lot of people that will never go back to an office building again. They're going to be working at home, which changes. Uh, we're going to see some things as far as when they build offices in the future. I think the other thing that I really look at is restaurants, probably one of the bigger wastes of food. Um, then, you know, where they waste up to 20 to 40 percent, depending on whatever you hear. When people eat at home, they don't waste it as much. It's called uh, leftovers. And I think that's some of the things that we're, we're, we're seeing. And that's why I think it's it's going to change the way the food service has been. I don't, you know, it's unintended consequences, but I'm not sure uh, we know exactly what's going to happen. But I do think that's a bigger factor than what I ever thought it was. You know, we've had, Corey, we've had quite a bit of our um, our supply chain, not just in dairy, but a lot of other things, too that has been just in time inventories and yeah that That's works exactly when everything's right. going along kind of normally but you throw a big rock in the pond and you get more than little ripples and i think that's one of the things we've seen here and i, I might ask jay and keith do you think we're going to start to maybe keep a little bit more inventories at different points along the supply chain so you don't run out of packaging so you you know, can go in the back of a grocery store and grab a few items to restock shelves, you know, those kinds of things? Well, I can tell you that I used to pride ourselves on that just in time, but I uh, tell you what, that would turn out to be just a disaster. Uh, so, I, uh, yeah, so the answer is yes. I, I'm going to let up on my uh, on that a little bit, and uh, we're going to be carrying more inventory of packaging. And, and things like that that we've uh, never thought was going to be a problem. So uh, that's a good, good, good point, Mark. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree with that completely, both uh, internally and with our customers. Um, you know, we had uh, again when we were in that uh, first ten to twelve days. Uh, you know, we had uh, we had large retailers that were just upping their orders at just just unbelievable amounts. And a couple of, you know, if you know anything about my background, I kind of grew up on that side, uh, working with our customers and logistics and transportation and customer service on the raw milk side. And I've known some of them for a long time. And, and I saw some email exchange and I picked the phone up and called one of them. And I said, you couldn't physically unload all that milk if we could physically get it to you. And he laughed and he said, yeah, I know, but that's what the, uh, you know, that's what the higher ups are telling me I got to have. And I went, well, don't order something that you can't take. And so there, again, to your point, um, we've gotten so used to just in time that, uh, that we're, we're going to have people take a step back and start thinking about inventory and start thinking about ability to have some cushion, if you will, in that supply chain. Uh, now, you know, the uh, the financial people will uh, argue with that, but um, empty store shelves speak real, real loud. They speak volumes. So let's come back to Mark and Chris uh, math analysis here. Uh, we thought that we'd be have about a $10 billion collective loss in the dairy industry. Chris ran some analysis what's available on the program side. Uh, people are coming in with questions of federal assistance looks like it would be six billion dollars short of dairy for dairy losses do you think there'll be additional help or the industry i'm going to add this in here have to suck it up and deal with it well i uh, you know the uh, the president did say after it was announced that there could be more in the future um that i haven't heard anything there hasn't been any details I think partly it's a, uh, well, let's see if we can get this thing to bounce back. 
you know, quickly and maybe have a little bit less losses. But, uh, you know, uh, there's just so much uncertainty right now. Um, yeah, that does not fill the entire hole. And it doesn't deal with the distribution issues and uh, other things of that factor. Mark? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, if we look at the $2.9 billion that we expect in direct payments to producers, you could say, well, that is $7 billion short of, you know, what you, you just told me the losses were. Okay, I, I agree with that. But um, there are other things going on. If you take a look at the uh, purchases that are going to be given away through food service, if you take a look at exports and a few other things that are, are helping to make the markets more optimistic, you get market price lift coming up out of that and that may help us uh, pull up faster than we expected to. So that's just saying we don't have to have the taxpayer pay dairy producers directly. Let's have the consumer pay uh, the dairy farmer by lifting those market prices. And, you know, that's what some of those purchase programs are going to help do. Well, we are five minutes out from the close of our program that's sponsored this week by Protecta, and we're glad to have them as sponsors. This is probably a real quick response. Keith alluded to it, but Mark and Chris are maybe better equipped to answer it. Is the rest of the world also stockpiling milk powder? We were talking about the European levels here from a number of years ago, but uh, it, it certainly looks like the U.S. is building powder inventories. You've seen that in New Zealand or anywhere else at this time? In talking with some of my European counterparts, you know, they are saying, yes, um, we're buying product and we are putting it away, you know, because although there have been a few other countries, notably, uh, France. I mean, the behavior of consumers is different. Here, consumers aren't going out to eat. They're staying at home, and we're seeing that we aren't purchasing as much as we a dairy product as we use through retail or through uh, restaurant sales. In France, it's a little bit different. People are staying at home, and they're asking their dairy producers, you know, don't slow down on milk production because people are eating more dairy products at home than they did going out to eat. So there are different occurrences that are happening in different countries, but Europe is certainly building some inventory. It'll take a while before we get the numbers to see how big it is. And we're gonna uh, go with one question here. This is pretty detailed here, but Mark and Chris, give it a crack here. What do you think the differential between class one and class three will be for the year? And how will the producer price differential adjustments play in? That, that might be a bit deep to delve into here in a minute or so, but uh, or maybe we can work on that for next week. I don't know, Chris, you want to take a whack at it? Uh, you know, yeah, that might take a little bit more analysis. It is a good question, though, to think about. Well, yeah. well the class one differentials themselves won't change, but you know, as utilization changes, then we do get some different PPDs. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, those, those are going to be a little bit different for us and different in different regions. So if we expect those class four prices to decline quite a bit, then, um, you know, Keith is going to have a different experience than we're going to have up here in the upper Midwest. We're gonna wrap up our today's program here, Hordes Dairyman live stream. And I wanna finish with Keith and Jay. And the final question here for you, what message would you like to share with your dairy farm owners at your co-ops and all of America's dairy farmers who are working on the front lines in the countryside during this COVID-19 crisis? And Jay and Keith, thank you for being our guests and take it away. Well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll first of all say, um, I don't know that if I've ever been prouder to be involved in the dairy industry, uh, to see how we as an industry have rallied and how we've worked together to address a, uh, again, unprecedented set of circumstances. Um, we are truly feeding America. And uh, I think that's something that, uh, that we can all afford to be very proud of. I think uh, I've encouraged our members to communicate with their creditors. Um, look for assistance any and everywhere you can. Uh, obviously, again, with smaller farmers on average, 
uh, hopefully there's going to be some uh, some margin protection there and again the uh, the government direct payments are going to be uh, are going to be more valuable to them per hundredweight than they will be for Keith's members of course uh, and I guess lastly uh, support your employees support your families don't forget to support yourself um, this is a very 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 tough time but lean on each other lean on the industry that's what we're here for and that's who we are the final word is yours, Keith. Well, I think I look at it as I'm I'm um, very proud of our employees at, at, in the co-op. They're very concerned about our about our owners because um, they're, they're we're tied at the hip. So there's been a lot of questions back and forth on that. I, I, if I talk to producers, I think I, 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 there's not near as much um, doom and gloom as it was two weeks ago. At least I have some positive things to talk to them about. Um, it's, it's the toughest thing for me is to ask these producers to make high quality milk and then dump it down a digester to make electricity or whatever. You know, the April to the April to June milk prices are going to be catastrophic. Hopefully, they've done some hedging, some of those things and other tools. But um, I think we're at the bottom. Uh, I do. I know we're going to talk about, and I think Mark was showing those class three prices, and I think that's very accurate. I do think if producers can get through this year, I do think next year will be a, a much better year. And I know they've, um, I know they've heard this before, but uh, the producers are, deserve a, a good year. So that's the way we're looking at it. Well, thank you, Keith and Jay, and to our regular members here, Mark and Chris. Thank you for being part of this week's dairy live stream produced by Hordes Dairymen, sponsored by Protecta. Our conversation will continue next week, Wednesday, May 13th, at the same time on the same network channel. And uh, we, we always gather the immediately after this program and look through the questions and consider inviting our next week's guests. Just very nimble. On behalf of my colleagues here at Hordes Dairyman, uh, this is Corey Geiger signing off of this week's program. Thank you for joining us.